don't have to read. And then my acknowledgement of a huge debt to two people, Lars Vilhuber, with whom I have worked since we hired him at the Census Bureau in 1999 to be part of LEHD, and Bill Winkler, whom I've known for about as long. Uh, they, uh, Bill is the guru of record linkage at the Census Bureau, and Lars is the guy who figures out how to implement things that other people have been puzzling over for quite some time. Uh, all right, so I will motivate this talk. And then I'm not sure uh, what you learned in the first week, but I want to make sure that you understand the classical Fileggi Sunter record linkage model, because it's at the core of the production record linkage systems that we use at the Census Bureau and that are used at most national statistical agencies. And it's deeply embedded in a lot of commercial software, but without uh, the tuning uh, opportunities that you might have, for better or for worse. And then I'm going to get into the meat of it. And most of this talk is to peel back the layers of the onion and, and show you what's going on when you do record linkage, especially what's going on when you do multiple uh, data source record linkage, talk about the kinds of errors that you encounter, and then show some examples about why we should uh, worry about them. And I will go straight to my main takeaway. I think it's incumbent on us, especially as excited as we are about using many of these new uh, linked data sources, to learn how to do the kinds of diagnostics and um, robustness checks that we would be routinely doing on uh, data that are better understood. Uh, just because some of the mechanisms aren't as well understood, I don't think excuses us from, uh, from thinking about them. And uh, before he passed away, Steve Feinberg used to bend my ear regularly about whether we would ever be publishing things at the Census Bureau about the quality of our various production linkage systems. So I will show you the papers that have been written about those systems so that you can see that that, uh, that um, uh, discussion did not fall on a deaf ear. All right, so here we go. I'm going to show you some examples. Some of these won't surprise you. Uh, probably none of these will surprise you. Uh, there are large-scale record linkage projects that are either already underway or substantially uh, um, in production. So to classify them, I want to remind you that there's lots of different ways in which record linkage uh, gets used. Some things are really deterministic record linkage. There's an exact ID. The keepers of the underlying data have a strong economic incentive to curate that ID. They're tax collectors, and that ID is associated with a taxpayer. Or they're, uh, they're beneficiary suppliers, and they will be audited. Uh, and so for a variety of reasons, we think that the social security number on many administrative records is well curated, and we think the employer identification number on records that are used as part of tax collection processes are well curated. And so that's what I mean when I talk about exact or deterministic record linkage. I don't mean the name matches exactly and the address matches exactly. That never happens. Right? Most record linkage is model-based, and the predominant model is the Fileggi Sunter probabilistic record linkage model and its enhancements. But the massive increases in computational power that are now relatively easy to access, even at the Census Bureau, we're getting cloud-based computing because the 2020 census is being done in the cloud. And so that means we have cloud authority to store titled data on the cloud, uh, which opens up those doors for us too. But there are other distance-based uh, model methods, and in particular, posterior predictive models, which I'm going to spend a lot of time on today. OK, so the Longitudinal Business Database is the single most requested database in the Census Research, uh, sorry, I made a mistake. Rewind that. In the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers, and I usually don't make that mistake anymore. Uh, we have lots of partners now. And how do they work? Well, there's the, the business register is uh, formerly known as the Standard Statistical Establishment List, is the, uh, is the list of businesses that the Census Bureau knows about from a variety of administrative sources. And the Longitudinal Business Database, LBD, links these uh, over time using primarily uh, exact identifiers supplemented with probabilistic record linking. And so you can see that the, 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 the issue when you do these linkages is if the ID changes, so this X11 goes all the way through, it has an ID change, and you have to find that with the record linkage techniques. This X2 N2 to X3 N3, this is a birth here and a death here, so your startup and, and uh, disappearance statistics are going to matter from the quality of the record linkage. 
The Bureau of Labor Statistics does essentially the same thing with the ES202 longitudinal data. They're quarterly. And uh, uh, Jim Spletzer gave me uh, this example. It turns out that these births, that's a birth, because it's the first year is known, first quarter is known, that's a birth. And the deaths, uh, that one died sometime between here and here, that's a death. Those affect how you allocate the various jobs that are created and destroyed by those businesses to the various functions, whether it's a new, a new business or a dying business or whether it's a continuing business that changed. So they have important policy implications, which I'll talk about later. No surprise here, the LEHD infrastructure. I found the simplest diagram of the LEHD infrastructure that I could find. The vast majority of this record linkage, when it is with census-based data, is probabilistic record linkage associated with substituting a protected identification key, a one-time pad encrypted social security number. Uh, but when things come from, say, the UI wage records, those have social security numbers on them, but the early years the Social Security numbers weren't well curated because these data are not used to collect taxes. These data, the ES202 data, are used to collect taxes. So the employer identification numbers, which come from the state UI systems, are well curated on those. And at various points in this assembly, uh, one system is using one set of identifiers and switches, and the other system switches at a different point in time. And as you might imagine, that causes the automated rec record linkers, record linkages to hiccup. Right? And finally, probably the one that you expected me to talk about the most, the Census Longitudinal Infrastructure Project, which is in support of the American Opportunity Study. Mostly it's using probabilistic record linkage across the top here to connect the, the decennial censuses and the American Community Surveys. Then it's using exact identifiers to connect most of these administrative data. And again, probabilistic record linkage to bring in our other surveys. So there's a lot of large-scale record linkage going on. All right. And most of it uses the classical Fileggi Center record linkage algorithm, especially for operations known as, sorry, I took English seriously as a high school student, unduplication, but it's deduplication in all the technical documents. Deduplication, which means you've got a list that you're going to base a frame on. A frame is what you sample from when you're actually doing a survey as opposed to the mathematical notation that you use to describe it in your articles. So you want this frame to have unique entities in it and you want it to cover your, uh, your target population. So you bring in lists from lots of sources and you deduplicate them so that there's no duplicates on the list and then you integrate them. That's called frame management. And then if you're doing something like a census or uh, sometimes a very large scale survey, you'll do a coverage measurement estimation, which means you will send the enumerators out to the same physical location twice and get what is supposed to be the same data twice and then link them back together. And many of these methods at the US Census Bureau were developed and refined for these operations, particularly deduplication of the decennial census of population and housing and coverage measurement in that same census, first implemented in 1990 by Bill Winkler. Lots of refinements are extremely well summarized in the textbook that Herzog, Sharon, and Winkler published in 2007. I'm going to do most of my summary from a computer science article by Kristen and Goizer. Kristen uh, does a lot of work for the Australian Bureau of Statistics and is a, uh, an internationally known record linkage expert. Goizer maybe too, but I don't know him. <laughs> All right, so there's a little bit of math in this talk. It's not, it's not um, uh, Guido. <laughs> So, so you've got two records, and they have this particular structure. They've got NA rows and NB rows, and they've got K variables in common, and then K prime A variables that are extra on A, and K prime B variables that are extra on B. Uh, everything but capital K and NA and NB can be null. You have what is known as the comparison space, which is the cross of all the records in A with all the records in B, right, which has NA times NB records by this many columns. A record in A is AI, a record in B is BJ. A, B sub R is a record in the comparison space. So matches are a strict subset of A cross B, and non-matches are a strict subset if you have unclassified uh, observations, and exactly the complement if you do not. In most of today's talk, I'm going to assume it either matches or it doesn't match. Won't talk very much about clerical resolution. Uh, although that doesn't mean it's unimportant, it just means I don't have as much new to say about that. All right, so what do you do? So 
in the standard application, you use comparator functions. And anybody in the audience who's done one of these knows there's lots of comparator functions. They deliver a 0 or 1, but they don't necessarily insist on equality between the records. There's lots of fuzzy ways to do the comparison. Okay? If there are k variables to do comparisons on, then there are 2 to the k possible comparisons. And the Falegi Sunter theory is based on this agreement ratio. In the numerator, it's frequentist, in the numerator, it's the probability that a particular uh, comparison on the earth record can occur given that, so the probability of a 1 on that comparison or the, the uh, correct probability statement on that comparison vector, given that the record belongs in the match set and the denominator is the probability that that will occur given that the comparison belongs in the unmatched set. So this is something like, for these records, do the first names agree, do the last names agree, do the street numbers agree, do the addresses agree, um, do the sex and dates of birth agree. All right, that's a particular agreement pattern. And the numerator is the probability that that would occur if the record belonged in the match set. And the denominator is the probability that it will occur if they belong in the unmatched set. Falegi Center is never implemented with this agreement index. It's implemented with this one, the one that assumes conditional independence. The conditional on knowing the true state of the record, you can factor this probability into the probability that the agreement function for the first variable would be 0 or 1, would be given that the uh, record is matched through the agreement function for the kth variable. And that r star, we take the logarithm of, and that's the, ag the agreement index. Now we need to build the classifier. Okay? So the classifier works by finding an upper bound t and a lower bound l that define the match set. So if your index is above or equal to t, you're going to be put in the, in the classifier match set. If your index is less than or equal to l, you're going to be put in the classifier unmatched set. There can be a positive distance between these two, and indeed there has to be a positive distance between these two if you implement this algorithm as it was originally published and implemented with controls on the false positive and uh, false negative rates. So the false match rate is defined as the probability that you put the record in the matches, but it belonged in the unmatched, and the false non-match rate is the probability that you put the record in the unmatched and you uh, uh, should have put it in the matched. And the full implementation, I'm not going to show you the rest of the algebra, the full implementation of the Falegi Sunter estimates mu and lambda as a part of the process along with estimating all of these conditional probabilities as a part of the process and delivers an optimal, in a frequentist sense, T and L, but they will always have a gap between them because that gap is determined by how tightly you control the false match rate and the false non-match rate. The tighter you want to control them, the bigger the, the gap will be. How, how big that gap actually ends up being depends on the empirical qualities of the data. I have an example coming, and in fact, here it is. Now, I apologize for the poor quality of this visual, and I got some grief at the Census Bureau when I put it up, but it's the original residual from Sharon and Winkler, reproduced in their 2007 book from the original. It has never been digitally cleaned up. On the x-axis is that weight, the logarithm of the um, conditionally independent agreement index. And this is uh, real data. It's from the 1988 dress rehearsal for the 1990 census. The 2018 end-to-end -end test for the 2020 census begins in August, which is just a few days from now. Uh, so every single one of these was clerically reviewed multiple times, including sending the enumerator back for cases that had contention at the enumerator. So they were multiply, clerically edited, and re-interviewed. Uh, we, therefore, we therefore know the truth, all right? And the truth is what it shows. If you see a plus, that's a true match. If you see a zero, that's a true non-match, okay? Here are the Falegi Sunter upper and lower limits, okay? So over here, these are the false matches here. And over here, there's some mixture with zeros, but the pluses over here are the false non-matches. These data are nicely separated. That means that the agreement score, the weight, 
does a good job of putting the records that should be linked on the right and the records that shouldn't be linked on the left. And many things that are good about record linkage work particularly well in this situation. Although you don't get a truth set to know whether you're in this situation very often and estimating the uh, false negative and false positive or the false match and false non-match rates is a very labor intensive exercise uh, except in cases where the conditional independence assumption can be shown to be valid. All right, so I'm going to do mostly Bayesian record linkage today, uh, which won't seem so strange to, uh, to the younger economists in the audience. Of course he's going to do Bayesian record linkage, but it was, it, it was not well received when it was initially proposed. All Bayesian record linkage does is say, well, we don't really care about the probability of, uh, of the data given the model. We care about the probability of the model given the data. All right, so this is the probability that I ought to set the record AB into the match set conditional on what I observe in its agreement function. And this is the probability that I ought to put that record in the unmatched set conditional on that. And those are complementary probabilities. So I can, in the, in the two file case, I can just use a logit or a likelihood ratio of those two probabilities. The classifier estimates these um, conditional probabilities, usually using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, and classifies it as a match when this one's bigger and as a non-match when this one's smaller. And if you want to be super technical, you can flip a coin when they're at equality, but I didn't bother to put that in the slide. Okay. So I've already said that we have lots of uses of, of classical record linkage, deduplication, frame updating. I'm going to show you some of those now. All right. So this is really a nice flow diagram, which I adapted from Kristen and Goiser. You've got two data sets. Well, in deduplication, those are the same data set. All right. You're going to put them through cleaning and standardization. And actually, I promised the census folks that I would talk about cleaning and standardization, but I didn't get two hours. I only got one. So I'm going to say that you really want to go to Herzog et al. 2007 to get a very good discussion of what you should be doing in cleaning and standardization. And you should know that the household standardizer at the Census Bureau, when compared to household standardizers that are commercially available, is quite good. It's better than any of the ones that are commercially available in the US. Um, uh, SAS, by the way, encrypts is its, but I have, I have heard uh, rumors that that might not be an unbreakable encryption. Uh, so then you send them over to an operation that has a lot of prior judgment in it, and I'll be talking a bit about that prior judgment. It's usually done by blocking, which means you declare some of the variables to be exact, and you match on them, and then your classifier, classifier space gets shrunk. I'll show some examples of that. A more modern way of doing that is to index these two data sets, which allows there to be overlap in the, in the blocks, basically. All right. And this part you can now do in parallel whether you've blocked or indexed. And so as rapidly as you can, you do all the pairwise comparisons in the different blocks. You, you don't compare a record to itself for deduplication. Right? And then you send it into one of these three bins. Okay? If it goes into non-matches, then in the case of deduplication, the, the non-matches are the same as records that are over here, so we're not going to worry about them. When we find a duplicate, we're going to delete the duplicate from A and get A star. So that is the deduplicated version of the list. All right. whether, whether you do clerical resolution or not, which will be grayed out in most of these slides, is usually a resource question. And um, many of these operations, especially when they're doing the decennial census, have to run in real time unsupervised. So the clerical operations are kept to a manageable. Although there have been times when there have been large armies of clerics at the Jeffersonville National Processing Center doing the resolution for the uh, coverage survey. Okay, what's classical frame updating? You have two deduplicated data sets, A star and B star. You put them through the same process, all right? But when you get a match or a clerically resolved match, you're going to retain A star and add the data to it that came from B star. Oh, I'm sorry. This is classical frame updating. In classical frame updating, the variables are the same here. I should read my own headers, all right? So when you get to the non-matches, you're going to add the non-matches to A star because this list contains duplicates of this list and uniques, and I only want to keep the uniques. So that's classical frame updating. Uh, this is classical AB file matching, all right? 
which does what I just said, but I'll say it again. You put them through the same engine, and when you come out with the matches, you add the data from B star to A star. So every unmatched record in A star is missing the B star data. What do you do with the non-matches? Well, you can either ignore them if you believe that you have a well-represented universe here, or you can use them to update A star, in which case all the A variables are missing from the records that were contributed by B star. All right. What do we do now when we process multiple files? We declare a master file, the one that is going to be the reference is going to be deduplicated and regularly updated. So when a new file comes in, it's linked to A, just like B was linked to A. All right. And then the data from C are added to C star or added to A star. And we, we would generally ignore rather than upstate A star with the C star. So now A star's got data from A, data from B, and data from C. But if B is missing, it's missing those data variables that were unique to the B record. If, if it doesn't get a link to C, it's missing the variables that were unique to the C record. So you, there is potentially a lot of incomplete data. Right. That will figure prominently in the uh, Bayesian example, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on how to fix it. All right. Here's what happens, though, when you've got lots of files. Well, you can match B to C, too. You've got the engine. You might as well do it. All right. And you get the matches, so you add the data from C to B. But what happens then? Now we have this problem that record A1 links to record B1, record B1 links to record C1, but record A1 doesn't link to record C1. This is called transitivity. And most people think in most record linkage operations, the multiple file record linkages should satisfy transitivity because you're trying to build evidence about an entity. And so the evidence should either be about that entity or not about that entity. Because these are all done with an algorithm that selects the best link and discards the rest of the, of the data, it's hard to resolve these. But the, the case happens frequently in business and household data. It really happens frequently in business data. We've had one audit done of the system that, uh, that um, Clip uses that um, uh, suggests that it's not as uncommon in household data as we thought. All right. The Bayesian methods can handle either case, so it's on you to declare what your correctly configured match set looks like. But I'm going to talk today about the cases that enforce transitivity, and they enforce transitivity across all the linkages of all the files. All right. OK. So how do we get record linkage errors? To talk about record linkage errors, we have to distinguish between the entity space, all the things that are at risk to be linked, and the comparison space, all the combinations that you're trying to link. All right. I'm going to talk about some suggested rate measures and do an extended example uh, from Kristen and Goiser. All right. So this is the entity space in their notation, but it's so similar to mine, I decided not to white out these subscript E's. So you have this A file and the B file you're trying to link it to. And this true match set is the intersection. And this unmatched set is the complement. Okay? And the union of these two is the entity space. So it's all the objects that you could um, treat as separate entities. Okay? The comparison space is all the records in file A crossed with all the records in file B after you've blocked, which means that after you've made some assumptions that uh, make this not an NA times NB uh, file most of the time. All right, so in this hypothetical example, these crossed hash cases are the true positives. The true matches extend all the way up. So the diagonal 1, 1 through 12, 12, these are all true matches. The matcher found these nine. And it missed these three. Okay? Every empty one is a true negative. And if it's empty, the matcher didn't try to do anything with it, so it's a true negative. But every time you see a classified match off the, off the diagonal or above 1212, 12, that's a false positive. These are things, excuse me, is that mislabeled? No, it's a false, that's right, it's a false positive. These are things that were matched but shouldn't have been, okay? So they've been labeled as matches. They're in M squiggle, 
but they belong in you. Right? So those are, those are the, or, the, the sources of error. And when you're in comparison space, the universe is, in this case, 25 times 20, all possible record comparisons. All right. So the usual standard for, for describing these is to put them in what's called a confusion matrix. This is a nice, simple confusion matrix because it's a two by two case. So the, the rows are the truth, should match, should not match. The columns are what your classifier did, classified as a match, classified as a non-match, okay? So I will, will uh, facilely switch between true match and true positive, false non-match and false negative, false match and false positive, and true non-match and true negative, okay? But all the notation is in TP, FN, FP, FN terms. And lots of different measures have been proposed, all right? But three of them get used but are somewhat problematic. The accuracy is just the true positives plus the true negatives divided by uh, the universe, okay? And this is dominated by the true negatives, all right? The precision is the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false positives. This is a very heavily used um, measure, usually because it's defined as one minus itself, the false discovery rate. And you can see that it does not depend on the true negatives. A common way to make decisions about the classification is to set the precision equal to the true positive rate or the recall. And that's called the precision recall break-even point. Some authors prefer the F measure. All right. if, you're, if you're into uh, ROC curves, then you are into uh, things like the specificity and the false positive rate. So the ROC curve is the false, false positive rate against one minus the specificity, the true positive rate, okay? It's too optimistic because of the dependence of the false positive rate on uh, TN. All, right. All of these measures require that you have an estimate of the true positive rate and the false positive rate, which is easy to construct in audited examples. Here are these things for, go backwards, go backwards, thank you. For this comparison space, all calculated out, okay? So the accuracy is essentially 100%, even in this really small problem, because most of the TNs are right, okay? But the precision is only 72%, and it doesn't matter whether I calculate it from the comparison space or the entity space. Usually, these are preferred measures, but the ones that don't depend on TN are the same, whether I use the entity space or the uh, comparison space. The false positive rate and the false negative rate where did it go? Uh, it's now jumping around. The false positive rate and uh, one minus the specificity are often used, uh, even though they depend on, on TN, okay? All right. What does it look like when we have multiple files but we don't change the theory? So if we're not going to change the theory, we have to continue to use something that looks like Fulegi Sunter. And I'm not going to do a lot of the details, but Sandelay and Feinberg did a principled extension of Fulegi Sunter to the multiple case, multiple file case, and it works exactly the same way as Fulegi Sunter, except it's exponentially more complicated because you have to do the you have to do the outcomes properly. Once you understand how the outcomes are done properly, then you can see why it gets uh, computationally complex in a hurry. All right. So here's the notation. All right. I've got three files in this example, labeled here in the author's notation, one, two, and three. And this notation means that I should put them into their own universes. One doesn't link with two or three, two doesn't link with one or three, and three doesn't link with one or two. The next possible outcome is one links with two, 
but neither linked to three. One links to three, but neither linked to two. Two links to three, but neither linked to one, and all three link. Notice that transitivity has been imposed in this outcome space. Right? It's easier to see in the connected graph. All possible uh, three-point graphs are the outcome space here. So what the Falegi center generalization is going to do is it's going to predict probabilities in the frequentist sense for each of these outcomes compared to unclassified and do the same thing as Falegi center does with the two case. So the two case is a special case of this. It's going to get the smallest possible unclassified space for a controlled error rate across all of these five classifications in the three-person case. All right. So what does this comparison space look like? Its comparison space is very complex. And here I'm showing it to you blocked. So in their example, they have, they have two examples. This is uh, census data from Columbia. And they've blocked it on, uh, I believe these are metropolitan areas. These are my speaker notes. Yes, it's homicide data for a particular set of Colombian towns. Okay, so it's the homicide data are blocked by sex, and the census data they're being linked to are blocked by the town. Right, so the comparison space just consists of the grayed out squares here, and I'm not going to do the example that these dark gray ones represent. So the comparison space, we didn't see all the other ones that are eliminated. Uh, I don't put the third cross on here because you can see all the comparisons that need to be made in this two-way. All right? Okay. So how do you implement it? The classifier chooses a predicted match by basically making an agreement index for each of the uh, outcomes associated with the k-tuples. So this is a three-tuple. There are five possible outcomes. If it's a k-tuple, there are the kth bell numbers possible outcomes. And if you don't know what the kth bell number is, you're in good company with respect to the speaker, but the formula is in the paper. Uh, if you do know what it is, then you've probably done this and know more about these algorithms than I do. But I'm not going to dwell on these methods. I'm going to pass directly to the Bayesian case. But when there are only two files, it specializes right back to Falegi Sunter. So it's the same theory applied to multiple files, except that the linkages are always uh, transitive. All right. OK. So here's the guts of the talk. I want to talk about Bayesian methods and virtual populations. And the key insight here is that record linkage is fundamentally a Bayesian problem. You're trying to collect information to make an inference that you're observing data on an entity. You might not even know that that entity exists before you get the data, that you don't have any such thing necessarily as a master list. You're trying to accumulate data evidence about the existence of an entity, either a household or persons or a business or an enterprise. All right. And so what you have to do is you have to specify and estimate a linkage structure. You need to allow all of the pairwise comparisons to deliver to you a link which says this pairwise comparison goes to some entity in this virtual population. The virtual population goes from 1 to j, and you don't know cap j. All right. These methods allow for errors in measurement in all the classifying variables, and extreme error in measurement is that it's missing, so that, that case is, is covered. The exact likelihood function I'm not going to show you, so you can't berate me for the fact that everything is discrete, but I will tell you that the Census Bureau itself has never published a real number. It, it has published discrete data for all outcomes. Some of those discrete spaces are large, but there are no real numbers in any of our data files. All right. It's implemented via Markov chain Monte Carlo. It's amenable to large-scale parallelization. And so problems that seemed impossible five years ago are now relatively straightforward. And I'm uh, hoping we can ramp up like that. But the best thing is you get the full posterior distribution, and you can do the error assessment. You can estimate the. Uh, the error rates that you need to estimate in order to adjust your statistical analysis for the fact that you didn't know an exact identifier on every case and completely replicate your frame with every file that you linked in on every variable. All right, so how does it work? We've got k files indexed by i. 
Each, each file has data. Okay? There is no loss of generality by saying they all have m variables because there's a data distortion indicator. So if it's one, xij is distorted, and the extreme case of distortion is it's missing. Okay? If, it's, if, if zij is zero, then the, uh, the, the data that you observe for the ith file on the jth person and the lth variable is the right data for that person. Okay? Notice that if you don't have this distortion and all these variables are um, exact, then you can just do exact record linkage, and then you have to make uh, a different set of probability discussions when you have incompleteness. But if, if, the, if there's no distortion indicator, you don't have any incompleteness either. So the best you can do is exact record linkage, identific re linkage on, your, on your m variables. All right? The size of the latent po population is a minimum of one. There are duplicates in every file, and they're all duplicates of exactly the same person. A maximum of the sum of the number of rows in all k files. Now here's the key variable, the linkage structure, which is latent. All right? In the ith file, the jth observation should be linked to some entity from 1 to capital J. And the latent data is associated with the linkage structure by a method that I will show you in a second. All right? So the actual data is latent, the linkage structure is latent, and the population size is latent. What do you observe? You observe this matrix of, uh, of records. Okay? All right. So what do you do? You need to estimate the posterior predictive distribution of the latent linkage structure, the latent data, and the latent uh, data fuzzing or data distortion matrix conditional on the real data. Um, trust me, you do it with Markov chain, Monte Carlo, uh, and a variety of different uh, implementation tricks. And out comes an estimate of the probability that any record ij likes to any other record i prime j prime conditional on x, which you can just estimate by summing the instances of the indicator function over the synthesized, or sorry, the sampled values of lambda ij for the h draw from the Markov chain Monte Carlo. All right. That doesn't get you all the way home because it's still difficult to publish the posterior predictive distribution of, of latent linkages. So we want to publish one linkage and then use that, the posterior distribution to assess its quality. All right? So to do that, we're going to define an arbitrary set of records as ordered pairs ij that draw one element from the file list and one element from the uh, record list. If everything has been deduplicated, then it's one and only one element from each of these two lists. But if they haven't been, then AJ can have uh, lists that include duplicates. There's a deduplication version of this algorithm. I'm not going to, that's a fine point. All right. We have to define the maximal matching set. The maximal matching set is the set of records where every one of them says, I belong to person J prime, and no other records in the comparison space belong to J prime. That's the maximal matching set. Okay, And I can estimate the probability of every maximal matching set using this posterior, in fact, using this equation. All right. So I can estimate the most probable maximal matching set. That is the set that has the largest value for the posterior probability of the matching set given the data. That still doesn't solve everything because a record can be in two most probable maximum matching sets. And so there's a refinement that says, I want the most probable maximal matching set that's shared. So it's the, it's the records ij, where for all the records in this set, ij and i prime j prime are in the same maximal matching set. All right. So basically, you isolate all the records in a, in a shared most probable maximal matching set, and no, those records don't appear in any other shared maximal matching set. So now we've got everything we need to use this engine to do multiple file record linkage and to use the same engine to assess errors. So how do you do the multiple file record linkage? You take this estimated linkage structure and you assign the data into the latent entities. So this shared 
maximal, uh, most probable maximal match set, puts record X1 and record X11 and X22 in latent entity 1. It puts record X13, X21, and X34 in latent entity 2. And you can go through and, and uh, create all the latent entities. When you're all done with this, if you've got straggler records, they just get put in their own latent entity. All right. OK. And you can do a confusion matrix. But the confusion matrix is more complicated. So in this example, it is the 1982, 89, and 94 waves from the National Long-Term Care Survey, which have been classified by sheer most probable maximal match sets. OK? And so on the x-axis is the true pattern of matches. These had social security numbers in them, so the social security match is taken as true. The record only comes in 82, only comes in 89, comes in 82 and 89, 94 only, 82 and 94, 88 and 94, and all years. The heat map shows the relative probability of the shared MPMMS being in that true pattern versus the same thing on the estimated pattern. So the vast chunk of the mass is sitting on the diagonal, OK? And these off diagonals are the various classification errors that this multivariate one can make. There's not two, so it's not as simple as false positives and false negatives. It's, but this is the, the complete confusion matrix for this problem. All right. Classical analysis of the effects of linkage errors on statistical models focuses on errors associated with the false match rate, errors associated with the false non-match rate, frame errors that are due to a faulty correspondence between the linked data and the conceptual frame, and specification errors which are due to components and compromises that you make in the implementation, that conditional independence assumption or various other assumptions, such that you're not actually using the complete likelihood function for the, uh, for the data. All right. OK, another, these are really the original figures from uh, Sharon and Winkler's original investigation. So the problem here is, how do you estimate that uh, true positive rate, the false positive rate, and false negative rate? You need the false positive rate, mostly for these regression corrections. And you can use a method called maximum likelihood with uh, expectation maximization algorithm to estimate it while you're doing the filaghi sunter But it only really works well if the data are cooperative with the filaghi sunter So this is an example simulated data. The filaghi sunter agreement, agreement variables on the x-axis and the uh, match frequency, the frequency of this particular index value is on the y-axis. Over here, our matches. Over here are unmatches. These are mostly zeros. These are mostly pluses. This is nicely spread out. It's also single humped, so things work well. All right. This is considered ideal data for using filaghi sunter You can estimate the false positive rate from these data directly as a part of the matching algorithm, and it will be accurate. This is sort of a typical case. There's a lot of overlap. When there's a lot of overlap, that means when you draw in your two lines, you either have to put them pretty far apart to control the false positive rate and the false negative rate, and that means you spend a lot of clerical time, or you put them close together and you accept larger error rates. Okay? And here they're right on top of each other. You should think of this as the prototypical case for linking business data. All right. Okay. I know you can't read this table, and I was heckled badly for it when I gave my dry run. But what it basically says is that in the good case, you can estimate the, the, uh, the false positive rate quite accurately. The estimate that comes out of the EM applied to the filaghi sunter data agrees with the true one quite closely. It's OK in the case of the mediocre overlap, and it's uh, not OK in the case of the data all stacked on top of each other. So what do you do with this? There are regression adjustments that you can use the false positive rate to fix the bias and the standard error and the regression coefficients that's associated with having positive false positive rates. Okay? If the matching scenarios are good or me mediocre, they're not particularly important. If the matching scenario is poor, they are important. Those, uh, those techniques were re refined by Lahiri and Larson in their 2005 article, and they also fixed the estimation of the standard errors. Uh, playing labor economists now, we use standard errors. Uh, I, I didn't hear. Uh, 
<laughs> heckling last night, that's uh, where that comes from. So the lahiri larsen correction, which basically says, take the output from the Falegi sunter estimation and use some of the rejected um, matches to estimate your false match rate. Or your false, and your, well, you need the false match rate to do this one right. Okay, if you do that, then their simulation cases are nicely spread out and uh, so nicely spread out and not so nicely spread out. In the nicely, nicely spread out of simulation case one, in that case, the Sharon Winkler correction works okay and the Lahiri Larson correction works much better. So this says that the 90% the confidence interval covers the true value properly, okay? In the case where the data aren't so well behaved, all right, the Sharon Winkler estimator does okay, does better than naive. Uh, naive means you didn't do anything. Uh, robust means you thought you were correcting the standard errors. Lahiri Larson is you're doing the correction that's based on estimating the false positive rate. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's a good summary, okay? The takeaway from this is it does matter that there were linkage errors when you're doing even a simple statistical analysis like a regression, okay? It matters a lot when you're linking establishment data. Uh, this was one of my thesis students at Cornell, Ling Wen Zhong, and this is a chapter from her thesis. See, I didn't list me as a co-author because I'm not a co-author of the chapter of her thesis, but I might be responsible for some of these calculations nevertheless. All right. This is a hand audit of the links of the establishments in the LEHD data to the links of the establishment in the census business register. And the top panel is the false match rates, the false positives, and the bottom panel is the false non-match rates, the false negatives, all right? And what you can see is that if you stratify the, so, the, so essentially 900 cases were done at the employer level, 900 cases were done at the establishment level, and then from the non-matches, 900 were sampled from both of those and, and hand audited to estimate these rates. And the false match rates at the establishment level are not particularly high. They're not in the troublesome range. At the employer level, they're higher, okay? The false non-match rates are actually quite high. That's 44%, okay? 63%, 73%. What that did was that detected an error in the blocking assumption, not one you can do a lot about. You only know the state on the LEHD side, so you're looking in the same state on the business register site. You're blocking on state. Blocking variables and errors in blocking variables are what inflate your false match rates, okay? False non-match rates. Remember to say all the words every time. They inflate your false non-match rates, okay? All right, what do I mean by frame errors? A frame error is when you take the data, you link it, and then you analyze it as if it represents the population you thought it represented. This is every single social security record from the LEHD data all the way back to the beginning of time, all the way to uh, 2013, right? And this is the inequality measures, 99 to, to P1, 95 to P5, et cetera, and the variance. And it looks like they've all been flat since 2000, except for possibly the variance. Those are all the data. But the correct frame is workers. And a lot of these social security numbers have um, uh, unusual provenance because the records are not ones where the administrator of the data has an incentive to clean them up. And some of the users of the data might not have an incentive to pay any attention at all to the social security number. All right. So these are all the records that were thrown out because they failed various conditions. Invalid social security number, uh, the person was less than five, between five and 13. These you might have wanted to put back in, but it doesn't make much difference. Uh, there probably aren't six million uh, 13 to 18 year olds who had um, social security numbers. These people we took out of the, of the universe, so they're removed. These people held more than 12 jobs uh, during that year, right? There's a nice clean break between holding more than three and holding more than 12, and, and these last ones are others, all right? When you take them out, Sure enough, this is a properly constructed frame with all the flows in and outs properly managed. And sure enough, inequality has gone back up since 2000 and spiked during the Great Recession. So it does matter that you want to be, when you're done with your linkage, you still want to make sure your frame covers the right population, okay? Jim Spletzer supplied me with this example. When the business employment dynamics series was being constructed by the, by the BLS, he was the primary researcher in charge. 
They tried lots of different methods of doing the temporal linking of the establishments. And each one produced much different entry and exit conclusions. So they documented this in a, he says, not very well cited technical paper. But it's clear that behind the scene decisions about what you, how you block and how you implement the record linking strategy had a big influence. It's exactly those, what's, what do you call a new business and what do you call a dead business that I showed you in the original linkage example. All right. Specification errors. There are very large differences in the validation rates, whether you use, depending on whether you use person and housing unit characteristics when you link to the American Community Survey. And so your regression sample of the completed data is not the same as your regression sample of the incomplete data. You need to deal with the data that are missing due to the, to the linkage. You can do that by either adjusting the survey weights or you can use multiple, impl implement multiple imputation. Changes were made when this was well documented. Changes were made to the PVS process. That's the automated record linkage that the census uses to produce a clip, among other things, uh, that attenuated the, the, the regression bias from the uh, failure to link that's related to characteristics. Okay. The Bayesian analysis is also able to handle this neatly. Okay. So here's another example. By using sampling from the posterior predictive distribution, this is a national time series constructed from the LEHD data in the quarterly workforce indicators. And the colored areas are the standard error bands that account for some of the linkage errors in those data. All right. This is an excellent example from uh, two Italian statisticians. In the record linkage and regression model, they have a, a true beta, it's two. And they allow the record linkage and the regression model to be estimated simultaneously with Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And it does a nice, tight job of fitting the correct um, uh, beta coefficient. If you just use the regression model and plug in the data from the record linkage model, it's still OK. It's centered on the right place, but it's not very tight. And we don't want to talk about these other two methods because two is over here. Okay. The same thing is true if you're trying to estimate the true positive rates with the, uh, with the um, Markov chain Monte Carlo data. Right. In real data, it also matters. All right. This is the regression coefficient from the true data. This is income in 2008, logarithm income in 2008, logarithm income in 2010. All right. And the linkage process dragged the distribution of beta to the left. Okay. They don't have a particularly good correction for that, but it's important to know that that, that is what it did. And then they have some examples of ways you might be able to correct it. Uh, taking logarithms helped a lot. Not, no surprise to the labor economists. All right. OK, I'm going to finish with some food for thought for the clip data. The successful matches are very high. The false match rates are very low when you're using the full set of linking variables and passes. But the false match rates can be troublingly high when you only use a subset of the linking variables. Commercial data doesn't link as successfully as administrative records, and there are no estimates of the false non-match rates. There are estimates of the false match rates. Okay. So what you want to look at is you want to look at a study that we commissioned from NORC. Ed Mulrow was the um, lead author. In the posted version of these slides, the references will be in there. These are all the validated match rates, and you can see they're all up in the 90s. So they do link substantial portions of the, of the records. Okay? That is to say, you're able to find a pick for substantial portions of the record, which means they are linked to that master file A star that I started out this discussion of. Okay? Here are the um, false match rates, the false positives. So when you put the, the data from the Oh, I forgot to put it in my notes. Somebody in the audience expand meds for me. I forgot to put it in my notes. It's administrative data from the uh, CMMS. Right? So the false match rate when you've got access to all the data is a trivial 0.005%. That would not trouble any of the algorithms that we we're working with. Okay? But if you can only use spatial data, which was true for a substantial fraction of the cases, then it creeps up to 1.7%. If you can only use name data, it's 0.2%. If you can only use uh, uh, date of birth data, it's 0.177%. Those are still pretty low. The commercial data has much higher false match rates 
when you have incomplete data and much higher ones, although they're still not particularly troublesome. That one at least isn't. This one might be when you're using uh, incomplete variable sets, okay? These are the false match rates at the cutoff. Okay, so that's, they're, they're the false match rates, which in this data, these data are auditable because the social security number is actually on the data, right at the cutoff. All right, so what do I want you to take away? It's time for us to consider doing sensitivity analyses when we use linked data. It's what Steve Feinberg was trying to get me to fess up to when he would corner me periodically, and I agree, and we actually have put a um, a task force in place at the Census Bureau to do that, uh, to develop um, usable measures of the linkage error and to adjust our quality standards so that we report such usable measures of the linkage error and you can use them in downstream analyses. We want estimates of the false match rates, use those estimates to assess regression-like models, address the representativeness of the analysis. That requires supplying some master frame information along with the linked data and perform the analysis with alternative linking strategies. There needs to be some robustness with respect to the assumptions that go into some of these linking strategies. We also need to begin full-scale experiments with virtual population models. Um, and we're in train to, we're, we're uh, getting ready to hire an expert on those to help us with that.